recording. Okay, hello. Um, so, um, um, so first of all, I want to apologize for, I think there was some confusion. Some people were confused about the metaphysics exercises when they're going to start. And they were like looking for it or whatever. I just sent an email about it. The first one is due a week from today and I haven't put it up yet. So you can't, you can't find it. <laughs> but uh, I will do that soon. Um, okay. Um, uh, are there any questions about any questions about anything like that, about the like administrative type questions? Yeah. Well, the first uh, metaphysical exercise be on this reading or the next week's reading? We'll be on this reading because because as as I explained, they and so there are there won't always be one. And you can see on the syllabus when there's gonna be one. But um, when there is one, it will be on the reading that I've already lectured about. So, and I guess this one would be due Monday, but Monday is a holiday, so it's due Wednesday. Yeah. There's no um, section this week, right? There's no section this week. That's right. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Um, um, now, I have to decide my office hours, but I still haven't done that. I'll, um, I'm still trying to settle the rest of my schedule, but I'll I'll do that soon. Um, okay, so I I, I probably should also apologize for like I mean I kind of built uh, up last time that these three readings were all going to be from that huge period of philosophy that we skip in all our courses, but in fact it's really only the third one that's going to be from that period, or a little bit of the second one. And but the reason is because like in order to understand what these people are talking about, you have to see some of the Aristotelian texts that they assume you know, right? So like they, they uh, well, forgot to mute everyone. Um, okay, um, and I should say. Uh, people in the Zoom who have questions, you can you can raise your hand or put a question in the chat, but uh, I might not notice. So it's like really better to, to like unmute yourself and say something. <laughs> All right. Um, right, so what was I saying? Um, right, so they like, they assume that you know Aristotle backwards and forwards. So they, you know, um, usually won't say when they're when they're talking about Aristotle or when they're interpreting Aristotle, <laughs> right? Like you're you're supposed to realize it because they're alluding to the well-known passage where Aristotle says whatever, right? So um, um, now, like, um, I'm not like that. Like, I don't know everything Aristotle said backwards and forwards, and I certainly don't expect you <laughs> to be. So that's why these, like these readings, I mean, hopefully I know it better than you do, but maybe, maybe not, depends who you are. But, um, but in any case, that's why these readings are supposed to provide a kind of synthetic, like, <laughs> like a simulation of be, like, like knowing everything Aristotle ever said, um, because it's, it's the things that are most relevant to the, readings we're going to do. Um, also, like, so I translated this myself. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that's clear, but that was clear. But anyway, this is, this is my translation. And so like, for the reasons I was discussing last time, I translated the Aristotle and the other stuff we're going to read later. And I did it in a way that hopefully will like, um, emphasize the continuity. Right, like you, like you have to know what Greek word what corresponds to what Latin word corresponds to what Arabic word. Um. Okay. Um. I guess I'll talk about porphyry next time. I'll just say now, so like the, the readings for next time are also all from Aristotle, except one that's from Porphyry. 
porphyry rates. So I mentioned platonic. Yeah, I said I was going to talk about it next time. Uh, yeah. I mentioned last time Plotinus, the founder of Neoplatonism, kind of dates 205 to 270. Um, so Plotinus didn't himself write down his works. He lectured and his student Porphyry was the one who, um, so this is approximate 234 to 305. Um, I don't know how they they know this, but usually, like you try to figure out by like events or people that are mentioned in their writings and stuff, you can narrow it down. Even if we haven't received any specific report about when they were born and when they died. Um, but anyway, so Porphyry um, was Plotinus' student. So one of the things he did is he wrote down Plotinus' works. It's called the Aeneas, the, uh, which means the the nine ads, right? It's like because it's nine books. Um, uh, so Porphyry wrote those down, but Porphyry also wrote a lot of his own stuff. Um, and we'll, we're going to read another little piece from Porphyry's commentary on Aristotle's categories later. Um, but so, but among the things that Porphyry wrote was an introduction to the categories. It's called in English. It's called the Isagogy. Right, because ace agoge in Greek means introduction. <laughs> right, so um, uh, uh, he wrote this introduction to the categories called the isagogy, um, which kind of got like tacked on to Aristotle's writings. So that people would start to read Aristotle because the categories in the traditional order of Aristotle's books was the first book. Um, and you can tell that also by the like the page numbers in these citations. It's like 1B25. That means it starts on the second column in the first page. <laughs> of the um, Becker edition of Aristotle. <laughs> That's how people refer to it right on line 25, right? So uh, quotes from the categories are, are going to be from like page one, whereas quotes from the quotes from the metaphysics are going to be like from page 1076. <laughs> so anyway, so the categories was the first book, but the isagogy, which is an introduction to the categories, people um, would read before they read the first book. And later commentaries on Aristotle, both in late antiquity and the Middle Ages, the commentators would write a commentary on the isagogy and then a commentary on the categories and so forth, right? So it was almost treated as part of Aristotle. Um, I think contemporary Aristotle scholars think that Porphyry misunderstood Aristotle and this is a distortion of Aristotle or whatever, but um, uh, it's like the Aristotle we're studying <laughs> is not the Aristotle that contemporary Aristotle scholars have in mind. It's the Aristotle that these people read for millennia, right? And according to them, Aristotle, I mean, not that they thought this book was actually by Aristotle. They knew it was by Porphyry, but it was like, it was part of the curriculum. In fact, Averroes, I think it was Averroes. Yeah, Averroes uh, didn't write a commentary to the Isagogy, but he said he didn't because um, there was uh, nothing in the Isagogy that Aristotle doesn't say better. <laughs> okay. Um, so he, he thought it was like such an accurate introduction to Aristotle that it was superfluous that you just read Aristotle. Um, okay, so anyway, that's why that will be part of the reading from Aristotle next time. Um, okay, so, but let me start talking about um, uh, this reading. And, you know, I, I said really quickly at the end last time what the format, at, format of this is. I hope you figured it out, right? Like in small print, there's an explanation that I wrote. 
and then there's the translation. And the translate the translation is the other thing about it is it's pretty like I'm trying to give as get as close as I can to Aristotle's actual syntax and give you some indication of what words are actually there and what are not. Um, because Aristotle, you have to fill in words when you translate Aristotle. Aristotle's style is so like telegraphic. You have to stick some words in <laughs> to make it make sense sometimes. Um, right. And I also like put in numbers, you know, and like um, everything I put in is in brackets. And all the footnotes are in brackets because as I was saying at the end last time, I don't, I think the footnote was invented in the 18th century. I know there's lots of footnotes in Hume and I don't think they're footnotes in Locke. So uh, even if Locke was a little bit behind the times, it probably means probably 17th or 18th century. All right. Anyway, um, so th that's that's just, I mean, like I hope that was self-explanatory. All right, so now I'm going to start talking about what actually goes on in these readings. Um, so there's um so again, Aristotle starts traditionally with the categories, this book called the categories. And the, the book contains a list of 10 categories. Um, what categories are is just like everything else in Aristotle interpretation is controversial. Most of the people from late antiquity in the Middle Ages though agree that categories are um, like highest genera. Of beings. And gen genera is the plural of genus. Anyway, genus is the singular, genera is the plural. Right? So the highest genera of beings, meaning that like if you collect things of the same kind, and we'll see more next time about what exactly that means, but you collect things of the same kind, um, and that gives you a species. And then you collect species that have something in common, and that gives you a genus. And then you collect genera that have something in common, and that gives you a higher genus, right? So this is not like the current biological classification system. There's only two terms, species and genus. And then you, you, and it's not just for living things, it's for everything. Right? And then you collect those genera and you get a higher genus. Um, but uh, um, it ends somewhere, you get a highest genus of beings. What that means is that things that belong to different highest genera, there is no genus that includes them both. Um, Right, so uh, like exactly how to understand that is something I'll talk about more next time, I guess. But um, so that's that's like one understanding of what the categories are. That um, um, like I said, it's probably the most common understanding of what the categories are. Um, in in, but it's not undisputed. Um, because, I mean, what this implies is that members of all 10 categories are some kind of things, right, that fall under species and genera. So this, what this implies is realism, right? I say this in almost every class, that real comes from race, which means thing. So like realism about the members of all 10 categories means there's such a thing as the quantity of this horse, <laughs> let's say. There's one thing that's the horse, that's a substance, and there's another thing that's its quantity. <laughs> so if you, if you think that's weird, like William Ockham, for example, you know, the very end of the Middle Ages, I think that makes no sense at all. Um, and therefore is called a nominalist, um, meaning he thinks that um,
like uh, five feet long is a way of um, referring to Socrates. It doesn't refer to a different thing. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't get. I sh I'm getting. I don't know why I'm getting off track into that. I know why, but what? How do you spell Occam? How do you spell Occam is a good question. Some it's spelled different ways. Sometimes it's spelled like this way, and sometimes it's spelled like this way. <laughs> Um, right. Anyway, um, we're not reading William of Ockham in this course. Um, so, um, the, and the people we're reading mostly agreed with this, this kind of simple explanation. So these are the 10 different types of beings, essentially. Then the most important one, and the most important distinction is between the first type, the first category with the substance, and the other nine, which are called accidents. Um, so um, now, I mean, to understand what this distinction is supposed to be and what these words mean, like I, you, you can't start by what, you, like if you looked up substance in an English dictionary, it wouldn't help you very much. <laughs> Right, like you, you can't start by thinking about well, we use the word substance. I guess if it's a dictionary, it's good enough. It would include some philosophical meanings or whatever. But uh, but um, you would still have a hard time figuring out what Aristotle means because I mean that is so. How can you figure out what he means? Well, uh, look at the examples. Right, he gives examples. <laughs> Um, so, um, a substance is, for example, a human, a horse, right? So, like, this is a substance. My favorite example of a substance is, um, Bucephalus. That's that traditional philosophical example of a substance. Bucephalus was Alexander the Hate, the Great Horse. It means cow head. <laughs> I don't know if his head looked like a cow or his head looked like a cow head or yeah. Are humans and horses two different types of highest genomes? Or are they both part of the highest genome of substance? It, it's not genome, it's genus. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, uh, no, so humans and horses are both substances. So that means they both fall under the highest genus substance. They fall under some intermediate genera as well, like animal and living thing. So, um, they differ in species, right? So here's another substance, Socrates. Um, um, Socrates is a different species from Bucephalus, but they belong to some common genera. Um, there's more examples. That, that I was just reading was from reading A, but there's more examples in reading F. Substance seems most manifestly to belong to bodies, because of, because of which we say that animals and plants and their parts Right, so at least apparently the a part of a substance is also a substance, right? So like Socrates' arm is also a substance. There's there's various tricky things about that, but that 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 would be the straightforward way of reading what Aristotle says here: animals, plants, and their parts, and the natural bodies such as fire and water and earth and each such thing. And those things which are parts of these or are made out of these, either of some of them or of all of them, such as the heavens and its parts, stars and moon and sun are substances. 
So, right, so it includes, um, so he's just given a list of basically every kind of bodies that he thinks there are. Yeah. I had a question about the sort of like Socrates' arm. Yeah. Because there's a passage which, as far as I can tell, is saying there are, we can talk about primary and secondary substances as like a thing that is subdividable versus a thing that's not, where like three apples is a secondary substance and an apple is a primary substance. But like, what thing other than the, you know, the pure, absolute, supernatural substance is truly indivisible? Like, isn't Socrates divide, divisible into a bunch of parts? And couldn't we divide Socrates' arm into fingers and so on and so on and so on forever? So, um, an individual... Notice what that means, right? It means that it, you can't divide it. <laughs> An individual um, uh, like Socrates, of course, can be divided into different parts. Um, but um, it's not a type of thing that, that various things can have in common. So it might be like physically divisible, but we can't talk about it as having multiple equivalent members. It's right. So like, and so, and by the way, three apples is not a good example of a secondary substance. A secondary substance is a species or okay. genus of substances. And like, not just any collection. I mean, um, it isn't even really a collection, right? Like, the species horse is not like a big body that's made out of all the horses. <laughs> it's not what in contemporary philosophy you call a mariological sum of all the horses. I mean, the species horse is um, something that's said of all the horses, that all the horses have in common. That, like how to understand that further, again, we're going to get into different Aristotelians saying different things. <laughs> um, but that's what it's supposed to be like. Um, so, um, and, and you understand why an individual is not that, right? Socrates yes. is not said of anything else. Yes. Yeah. So it would be like, uh, I was thinking when I was reading it, like, uh, Excalibur would be a primary substance, and then sword to denote it would be the secondary substance, right? Right. Assuming that artificial bodies are, are really substances, which is also controversial. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. Um, I mean, you notice that Ar that Aristotle isn't giving examples of artificial things here in his list. He's giving examples of natural things. Um, in other places, it sounds like, um, in some other places, it sounds like he's saying that artificial things are not substances, but are like composites of different substances. In other places, it sounds like he's saying he's giving examples of artificial things as substances. So again, the interpreters are going to dis, you know, like try to figure out how to reconcile this stuff. But um, okay, those are good questions. Are there more questions before I go on? Yeah. Can you talk about immovable substances? Yeah, I'm about to talk about that. Movable substances versus immovable substances. Right, so the, the whole list I just read was a list of different kinds of bodies. Right, there's plants, animals, um, their parts, the elements, and things that are parts of, I, I mean, uh, so like when you're reading stuff like this, and I mean, this is especially true of Aristotle, I think you can begin to see why it's because of his style or that, um, but it's true in philosophy in general, you have to stop and say, so this is what it says, the natural bodies such as fire and water and earth and each such thing, and those things which are parts of these. So what does these refer to? So I think these refers to 
fire and water and earth and each such thing. Right, because he already mentioned the parts of animals and plants. But you might think otherwise, right? That like so this is, you know, I mean, this is why like a tiny bit of Aristotle or Descartes, you know, can be enough to to like spend a long time reading <laughs> and write about writing about because there's all these questions. Wait, what does the pronoun refer to? This is another reason why translation is difficult especially between languages with different numbers of grammatical genders and whatever, right? The, like where uh, um, you have to figure out how, like it may be unambiguous in one language what the, what the pronoun, what the antecedent of the pronoun is, but it may be ambiguous in another language. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, uh, so those things which are parts of these or are made out of these, either of some of them or of all of them, such as the heavens and its parts, star and moon and sun. So like, um, again, elsewhere in Aristotle, it sounds like the heavens and its parts, star and moon and sun, are not made of the sublunar elements, earth, fire, air, and water, in, in no particular order. I just said those. <laughs> um, Right, so I guess that's included in each such thing at the end of the list of elements. <laughs> what, right, what the uh, the what the celestial bodies are made out of. Okay, so anyway, those are all lists of types of bodies, and then he says, um, but whether these alone are substances, or these and also others or some of these and others too, or none of these, it's all right. He doesn't settle anything in this passage in the metaphysics. <laughs> he gives every possible. Um, that, that's also, that also has to do with Aristotle's style, right? He'll, 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 he often starts dis discussing a topic by giving all kinds of different opinions of his predecessors, of like different things that we might think. And only later does he then settle down to what he's gonna say. Um, right, so, um, um, so, but he's leaving open here the possibility that in addition to bodies, there's some other kind of substance that's not a body. And that's what in the um, next reading, which is from book 12 of the metaphysics or metaphysics Lambda, that's, that's the book where, among other things, Aristotle discusses the gods. <laughs> okay. So, uh, um, so from this quote, he says, in this quote, he says, this is reading G, there are three kinds of substances, two natural and one immovable. So As I say in, um, uh, I think, as I said in a footnote there, um, I mean, these might seem like weird opposites, natural versus immovable. But in the physics, Aristotle defines natural or nature, and uh, he defines nature as a principle of motion and rest, right? Something um, is natural if it contains a principle of motion and rest. So like the elements are natural bodies because they contain a principle, like for example, earth tends down towards the center, whereas fire tends up away from the center. This is Aristotelian physics. Uh, earth has gravity that is weight, whereas fire has levity, tends up, <laughs> right. But, um, and obviously animals and plants have some kind of principle of motion within themselves. Those are natural bodies. Um, so immovable bodies are not, or sorry, immovable substances are not natural, right? Because if they're immovable, they can't have a principle of motion. It means the principle of its, right, to be, the nature of a thing is the principle of its own motion. So the immovable substances can't be natural. So what are they? Well, they're they're not on that list of bodies. 
Um, and uh, they're not artificial bodies or something like that, right? So that wouldn't be immovable. Um, so uh, there apparently are not bodies. And that that's actually what Aristotle says about them, right? So these are immaterial substances. So the natural substances are bodies. And the immovable substances are immaterial, incorporeal, I should say incorporeal. And there's two types of bodies, sublunar and celestial. Right? Because this is what the world looks like. First of all, there's this kind of like crap in the middle. That's where we are, <laughs> right? These are movable substances. They're generated and corrupted. That is, they come into and out of existence. Um, so they're not eternal. Um, they don't uh, move uniformly. They're subject to violence, right? Like, um, so, you know, Earth, has a tendency and chalk contains earth. <laughs> so chalk therefore has also has this tendency um, to move towards the center, but by violence, it can be caused to move. Violence is a technical term, right? By, it, I, can, I can make it do a violent motion that goes against its nature by doing that. Right, so um, that's what the things down here are like. And then, there's the sphere of the moon. And then there's a bunch of other concentric spheres. And there's an outermost sphere that goes around every 24 hours that has the stars in it, <laughs> right? The fixed stars. Um, and these other intermediate spheres, at least some of them have planets. Um, Aristotle is, uses a system of astronomy that's due to Eudoxus, where, um, where, first of all, it only uses concentric spheres, which is important for Aristotle's metaphysics, actually, right? Because according to Aristotle, the nature of the celestial substances is that they don't move towards the center or away the, from the center. They move around the center in a circle uniformly. So, of course, if you look up at the sky, you won't see the planets moving uniformly, right? They move this way, and then they move that way. That's right, when people say, like, Mercury is in retrograde, <laughs> that means Mercury is moving. I mean, of course, we know Mercury isn't really moving backwards. What's happening is that, like, um, the Earth is overtaking Mercury, right? That's what's really going on. But um, but so Eudoxus tried to explain this by by putting a bunch of extra spheres that don't have planets in between, and those extra spheres, like you add up the motions of this, the various spheres as you go out, and you get like more complicated motion. Mm -hmm. So like it worked pretty well. It didn't work that well. That's why uh, Ptolemy eventually added the famous epicycles, right, where the the planet doesn't go around in a circle, but it goes around in a little circle that's attached to a big circle. Um, well, you're laughing, but actually, like you can get an ellipse by like this is an approximation to a, to a motion of an ellipse. Um, it, in, in fact, in certain contexts, astronomers actually still use this, like when you're studying the way uh, stars move in the galaxy, you can, you know, you can approximate it by by thinking that they're at a certain radius and then they move around it in an epicycle. <laughs> anyway, yes, yeah, okay. Um, so but of course it's not literally true. Also it's not a risk, it's not a risk possible according to Aristotelian metaphysics. Right? That was one reason that people always said, and then they used this against Galileo in the end, people always said well, of course, this isn't really the way things are. This is just a calculating device. 
right? So, um, but okay. Anyway, so so going back to Aristotle's picture, the Eudoxin picture, right? So there's so there's a bunch of spheres. Each sphere moves at a uniform velocity forever. <laughs> Those are celestial bodies. And then where where do these immovable substances come in? And Aristotle says in Metaphysics Lambda that there are as many immovable substances as there are spheres, and that each one has the job of moving a certain sphere. And those are what Aristotle calls gods, although later people would call them angels. <laughs> right. So, um, um, and I mean, these substances are going to turn out to be really important in this course, right? I mean, in Aristotle there, I don't know if I would say they're an afterthought. I mean, I guess in some sense, he thinks that they're the most important thing and that, you know, and that uh, uh, metaphysics is like, especially concerned with these substances because they're the ones that, you know, from which all motion starts. <laughs> um, so, um, and the and things lower types of substances are kind of trying to imitate them, right? So, like the celestial bodies try to be as much like these immovable things as they can by just moving around uniformly, and things down here try to be like much like them as they can by propagating their species. Um, so they are the most important, but they, he doesn't spend most of his time talking about them. Um, but like, so uh, Descartes is going to say, is going to prove that he himself is um, an immaterial, incorporeal substance. And Leibniz is going to prove that everything is made out of an infinite number of incorporeal substances. <laughs> or that everything is made as an infinite number of angels, as I like to put it. Yeah. So um for like natural uh for natural substances, there's the sublunar and then the celestial, right? Like yeah. Uh, is sublunar supposed to be like literally like like that smaller circle there is everything and not that one sorry that or this yeah 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 so that that's all the sublunar stuff yeah okay because it's inside the sphere of the movement right this the, this direction is down obviously and then are the, this is the earth and then the the what's orbiting that all the like bodies which are orbiting that are the celestial uh, yeah, these are all the celestial bodies. Okay. Now, I mean, like that part is, I mean, like, so this part is important for understanding what Aristotelians are talking about when they talk about different types of substances. Um, the right, the um Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz are all post-Galileo. Although Descartes, as we'll see, like mentions that he wanted to publish some stuff that he had written about physics, but he heard that of the condemnation of Galileo and decided to withhold it. <laughs> but um, so like they don't literally believe in this picture, but there's going to be things that are similar. <laughs> yeah. Do they consider the space in between those to be celestial as well? There. So I think on Eudoxus's picture, there isn't really space in between them. Maybe I haven't drawn it exactly the right way. These are like spherical shells that are nested in stage side each other. Okay. Oh. Right. That that again makes it incomprehensible where how this epicycle thing could work. <laughs> um, um, also, according to in, in Ptolemy's system, the the circles are also off center. So that they would like crash into each other if they were so. <laughs> um, but um, but again, Aristotle, you know, doesn't know about that. That's that's way in the future, Aristotle. Yeah. Um, 
Well, that's actually a good question, but like, but I mean, for now, it seems like um, um, the answer is they're all substances, so they all belong to a common genus. Okay, but he, but they, they all belong to a common genus, but not neither of those ones are considered higher than the other. Well, okay, so I mean, one is higher than another in some sense, right? Like these are better or substances. But uh, like, uh, uh, by the way, according to Aristotle, rest is always better than motion, right? Because motion is for the purpose of getting somewhere. <laughs> Being there is better, <laughs> right? So, uh, um, yeah, so these are higher in some sense, but they're not higher genera, I guess. They're coordinate genera, right? So if I were to draw this, like under substance, you would have, you know, whatever divine substance versus body. In another body, you would have sublunar. Versus celestial, and then it would go on from there. At least that's, I mean, this is one way of organizing it anyway. I guess actually, porphyry, the famous tree of porphyry, it doesn't work that way. It first divides into living and non living. And then this divides into sublunar animals. and like celestial animals, because uh, according to like at least pagan Neoplatonists, uh, according to, um, so according to Porphyry, for example, these, um, these bodies are all alive. They're more alive than several million or something. Right? They have a higher amount of life. Um, but anyway, so that, that, so like, I mean, so these are coordinate genera, and that was, neither of them was higher than the other. Yeah. Does non living mean dead or inert? Like, is it like, I don't know, a dead squirrel or like a baseball? It's like a, well, it's like, Earth, air, fire, water. Okay, <laughs> because we still don't know if baseball fits into the category yeah. of substance. <laughs> yeah. What what category would it fit into if not? It wouldn't be a single substance. It would be a composite made up of uh, different substances. Yeah. Okay, interesting. So, okay. Yeah. Um, substance cow. Or substance. Yeah. Cow. Well, or or it would be or or it could be like um like a statue made out of metal. The substance is metal, mm. and the shape is, which is an accident in the category of quality, that the shape is what's added by the human artisan. So the human artisan doesn't make a new substance, but only adds a new accident to the existing substance. Okay, um, I understand. <laughs> well, so an, an invention can't be a substance, uh, or it's argued. Yeah, according okay. to this way of thinking. Okay. Um, on the other hand, I know Al-Farabi lists glass as an example of an artificial substance. So Ray, he seems to think that you can make a new kind of substance. So material, OK. Gotcha. Um, uh, I don't know who's first, but I'll just go, yeah. I have a question on like, what makes glass like so special that like, Right, what makes glass special? I I wasn't saying there was something special about it. I was just saying that from the fact that Al Farabi gives it as an example, he appears to think that artificial substances are not. Uh, he first, he first, he he appears to think that there are. 
I don't know, maybe I would have to reconstruct the whole context. <laughs> but he, he appears to think that you can make something that's not merely a composite of different substances, right? Because glass is, is homogeneous um, and is not merely a quality or added to an existing substance, but has its own different nature. That's um, but a lot of Aristotelians wouldn't say that. And so they would say if they admitted that glass was a was a was a species of substance, they would say something that like humans are able to uh, arrange natural causes so they bring about the glass, but they they can't actually make glass. Um, Thomas Aquinas says that about bread because he has to explain that bread is a substance to explain the Eucharist, but we'll talk about that later. All right. Yeah. Yeah, so baseball is not a substance because it's made of smaller things? Well, I mean, a horse is made of smaller things, yeah, right? Too. It seems like all living life is made of the substance of DNA. Right? Well, it's, you know, I mean, so the, the basic problem is here that it, like, it doesn't have its own principle of motion within itself. Um, I don't know. Is that the basic problem? Well, it's also like it's not so much because I think this was the misunderstanding behind my question earlier. Is it's not so much about like what stuff there is as how we sort the stuff in order to talk about it. So yes, right. a horse can be divided, but you don't see a horse and go, "Oh, look, there goes the left side of a horse and the right side of a horse." Mm -hmm. You know, you think of it as a an individual with its own motive force and a baseball is not an individual with its own motive force what if you view it's it as an assemblage of smart smaller pieces of production yeah I, well I, I do aristotle yeah. the thought of well no i mean the aristotle probably would the aristotle does see it as an assemblage of things each of which is a natural substance um i anyway i like i I don't want to get too bogged down in this because, um, because you know, for one thing, as I said, Aristotelians disagree about all this stuff. So, like, whatever I tell you about it is going to be, um, you know, uh, and this particular issue is not really going to come up later in this course. And I still haven't. I mean, I've given you a lot of examples of substance, which is good to like get you thinking what this word substance means, right? But I still, but I really, I want to get to talking about the distinction between substance and accident and, you know, what's going on there. So, um, all right. So, um, so there's a diagram that I put in my notes and I'm going to draw up here also. Um, Right, Aristotle establishes these two distinctions. This is in reading B. Um, of being, some are said of a subject. So we have said of a subject. And Oh, sorry, and not said of a subject. And we have in a subject and not in a subject. Now, uh, I mean, you probably want to ask, what is a subject? <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I think the best thing for now is just to, you know what, I tried the right subject here, but I wrote subjects. Um, it's just, I, I mean, a subject, right? So the Greek word is people came in on, and subject is a, a calc that is like a, a morphine by morphine translation. Hupo is translated as sum, and Hamanon is translated as yectum, right? So, and it means like lying under. 
Great. So what is it? What is a subject? A subject is just something that something can be said of or um, right. It's so I mean it's that is it's related to the grammatical term subject. Um uh that's not all there is to say about it from an Aristotelian point of view, but that's all I'm gonna say about it for now. So in particular, you shouldn't um confuse subject with substance. Substance is a type of being. The subject is like again something that you can say something about, something that something can be predicated on. All right, so we have these four boxes here. Um And primary substances go here, according to Aristotle. So a primary substance is not in a subject, and it's not set of a subject. Um, secondary substances go here. Right, so the, the thing I've given the small no Roman numeral, um, oh, I drew this kind of the other way from the way it's, <laughs> I, I drew it here. But anyway, the thing I gave the small Roman numeral to, to in the reading, some are said of a subject, but are not in any subject. Human, for example, is said of a subject, namely a certain, and I've inserted the word individual, human, but is not in any subject. Um, right, so if you wanna know what the set of a subject mean, <laughs> look at the example, right? That's the place to start. So what is, what human, so, so here's an example of human, and it's set of a subject, for example, Socrates. or horse, and it's said of a subject, for example, Bucephalus. So apparently what said of a subject means is, is that um, it tells you what something is, right? That is when you ask, when you point to Socrates and you ask, what is this? The answer is a human. Or the answer could be an animal. Right? So the species and genera of primary substances are what Aristotle is calling secondary substances. The term secondary substance is is, is from reading C, but um, but it appears to be the same thing that he's talking about also in reading B. Okay, so that's what said of a subject means, right? So this is the same thing I was talking about before. Socrates is not said of any subject, right? Like there's nothing you can point to and say, what is that? And the answer is, it's a Socrates. Um, Socrates is the name of an individual, but it's not the um, a kind of thing that something can be. So that's why Socrates is not said of any subject. And similarly, Bucephalus. OK, so what does in a subject mean? And uh, this is and this is the thing that I put in boldface. And it's super important because, at least as this passage is traditionally interpreted, this was when Aristotle says what in a subject means, he's telling you what an accident is. Right, all the substances we know are down here, are not in a subject. So all the things that are not substances, that is accidents, are going to be up here. Um, and so the description of what it means to be in a subject, first of all, is the definition of accident, but second of all, tells you how accidents are related to substances. Right, they're in substances. What does that mean? And Aristotle says, by in a subject, I mean that which is in something, 
That's the first part, but not as a part. And then I added of that thing, right? So it's in something, but it's not a part of it. Well, that, I mean, that goes together with what we saw before, right? Like Socrates' arm is a part of Socrates. And Aristotle said the parts of substances are substances. Um, so Socrates' arm is in Socrates. I guess that's a little bit unnatural to say. But <laughs> um, um, it, but it is inside him, right? <laughs> like it's within the borders of Socrates. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm just confused still about the definition of like subject that you said, where it's something you can say something about but not be confused with substance. What would be an example of that of something that you can say something about that's not a substance? Well, so, I mean, um, the examples that Aristotle gives up here are, are going to be the answer to that, right? So he says, um, some are both said of a subject and in a subject. This is, this is the thing I gave the small room a numeral for. For example, science slash knowledge, right? That's my translation of the Greek word episteme. Later from epistemology, <laughs> right? So I mean, the 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 this is the traditional Latin translation of this is scientia, scientia, scientia. Depending how you pronounce your Latin. All right. So anyway, um, so but both of these can mean either knowledge or science, like a science. Right. Okay. So anyway, so um, so something that's both said of a subject and in a subject. For example, science or knowledge is in a subject, namely the soul, and is said of a subject, namely grammaticality. <laughs> right. So here's the picture. Now, I mean, the soul thing is a little bit confusing, and. Uh, I mean, there wasn't really a place for souls in that in that list, but in other places, Aristotle seems to say that souls are a kind of substance. But then it's very controversial exactly what that means. Yeah. Um, no, I'm just I'm just confused because we don't differentiate from like what an immovable substance is. Well, okay. I, I mean, let me. Um, that's a good question, but let me finish the the thought here. So. So, so, so forget about the thing about us about it being in the soul. Let's say that that it's it's in Socrates, right? That is, um, science is in Socrates. This is this is the way I, I draw accidents. Um, I think one of my students a long time ago gave me the names of the Doritos, <laughs> right? So this is where I draw an, a Dorito is an accident, right? So this is like the accident of science or knowledge. It's in Socrates, so perhaps in Socrates' soul, if that's something different. But it's also said of something. What is it said of? Grammaticality. So, um, I mean, I guess maybe I shouldn't have drawn a Dorito for science or knowledge, because there's an individual accident that's in Socrates. That's his knowledge of grammar, or this might this might mean literacy or something. I'm not sure, but anyway, his knowledge of so this is the grammaticality of Socrates. And science or knowledge is said of it because what is it? It's science or knowledge. It's a science. Um, or it's, it's um, uh, a kind of knowledge that Socrates has. Um, so, right, so this is an example of a subject that's not a substance. The subject is this accident. And you can tell from um, one of the later readings that uh, what category this is going to be in. It's going to be in the category of quality, right? So, so actually, 
right? So that so we draw a different tree of porphyry here. Or the highest genus is quality, right? And then you divide quality into different kinds, and eventually you get down to science or knowledge, episteme. And then that has various species under it, like grammaticality. And then presumably under grammaticality, oh, this is also controversial, are the individual accidents of grammaticality like this one that's been Socrates. So um, although in it, Aristotle doesn't say that in that passage, right? He only goes as far as saying it's said of grammaticality. Um, I guess that's what I was getting like confused about before. We, this is this is really this is not grammaticality. This is the grammaticality in Socrates. It's an individual accident. Okay, but so the point is everything up here is those are all the things that are in this box here. They're set of a subject. And they're in a subject because um, they're what they're set of is accents. Yeah. So, so what what do you mean by set of? I mean, I just don't think I'm fully understanding it. Like it would be like, oh, Socrates like has that knowledge, and then the knowledge is also in him. No. So what it's said of? So what like science or knowledge? So science or knowledge is not said of Socrates. Right? Like if you ask what's that and you point to Socrates, the answer is not going to be that's science or knowledge. Right. right? Science or knowledge is in Socrates, not as a part, right? That was the second part of the definition. You can't you can't cut Socrates into parts and one of them will be his his grammaticality. Oh, right. Okay. It's but it, it but it's in Socrates in the way an accident is in a substance. But what? But then things are said of it, right? Like that it is science or knowledge. Does that does that help? Yeah, that? that definitely helps. I just think then I get confused again because of the invisible substances. Is would it that be what those are as well? The immovable set wouldn't what be what they are. Like I thought, like the immovable substances were like substances not composed of matter. So, like if you cut up something, it had been like you wouldn't see it, like the immovable substance. So then I thought, would science could not be counted as an immovable substance? Like you can't see science. Um. Well, okay. So some of the accidents in the category of quality are sensible qualities. But others of them are dispositions or uh, habits. Science uh, presumably falls under that classification, actually. So um, yeah, they're so they're not sensible qualities, but uh, they are qualities that a that a body can have, it causes it to act in certain ways. Um, is that the right way of putting it? Accident doesn't cause the substance to act. Well, anyway, never mind. But um, we're, so, yeah, it's not just anything. So, it, like, put it this way: immovable substance doesn't mean um, just anything that we might think of as an abstraction, right? The immovable substances. Now, I mean, it's true that, um, and it's something that Neoplatonists have to deal with that the that the closest thing to the those immovable substances in Plato is the forms. So um, so Plato, at least the way the Neoplatonists set things up, Plato is, is wants to say that this, for example, human is an immaterial substance. And then there appears to be a disagreement between Plato and Aristotle about that, right? Whereas, so that, that Plato thinks that the immaterial substances are, I mean, and Plato does use the same word that we're translating as substance. The Greek word is ousia. It's a form of the verb to be. When you see it in Plato, it's usually translated as being. 
right? Like the forms are the realm of being, whereas down here is the realm of becoming. Right, so anyway, so like there at least appears to be a disagreement between Plato and Aristotle, where Plato says that the image, what are immaterial substances? Immaterial substances are like um, the uh, paradigms <laughs> or examples that, that cause species down here, but because the, the things that belong to the species are images of them. Whereas Aristotle says the immaterial substances are these things, gods or angels, right? That um, so they're uh, they're not related to the things down. I mean, the things down here do try to imitate them certainly. So that that's still that that's still there, but um, but they don't uh, they don't. Uh, correspond to species of things down here, right? Rather, they correspond to the to the spheres, because each one is in some way the the mover of, of a certain sphere. Um, I mean, you can say it this way that that like that, but this would be misleading. But you can say something like, yeah, I mean. For for Plato the, or at least for a Neoplatonist Plato, the predicates are like are prior to and a higher kind of being than the things that are applied to <laughs> the subjects, right? Whereas for Aristotle, it's always the 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 thing that's a subject but not said of any other subject, the ultimate subject. That's the primary kind of being. <laughs> Does that, I don't know if, if, if all of that like stuff I just threw out helps. Yeah. 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 Yes. So when you say, I hope I'm not terribly oversimplifying, but like when you say it makes sense to understand the change from Plato's ontology of forms to Aristotle's theory of categories as like a change from a kind of monism of the, the great forms that are the most existent thing to a kind of, I guess, like theistic dualism where there's a material world and a, an immaterial world? Uh, you look like I've given you a headache. I'm assuming that that's deeply wrong. No, uh, don't assume that. Yeah, people always assume that when I when I do this, that I that I that that it means that I think you said something terrible. No, it just means that I'm trying to think. Uh, <laughs> uh, because, I mean, would it be right to say that? Uh, there would be a certain sense. I mean, okay. Yeah, I mean, the reason I'm doing this is because it's so complicated. Like what the right answer to that is. Like there's so many different ways you can look at it. I mean, first of all, like as an historical question, um, was there a transition from Plato's theory of forms to Aristotle? Not clear. It's not clear to me that Plato actually proposed the theory of forms, as opposed to having Socrates propose it in some dialogues for certain reasons. Uh, I mean, although Aristotle seems to think that, and they say that Aristotle was Plato's student, although we don't know anything about what that meant, <laughs> right? I mean, th this is something you have to know about ancient history, like how different ancient history is from modern history. Like if you were writing the history of World War II, your problem would be that you have like an enormous amount of information and you have to find the right things to put together a good story, right? But with ancient story history, like if you're writing the history of the Peloponnesian War, basically we only know there was a Peloponnesian War because of one book by Thucydides. <laughs> That's where all the information, that, right? And like, there's other ancient sources that discuss it, but they're they're dependent on Thucydides. Right? So, and it's like similarly, like if, you know, I mean, yeah, there's a report somewhere that Aristotle stated with Plato, and it seems to be credible. But like, what did studying with Plato mean? How long did that last? How close were they to each other? You know. There's no, like, we don't have their, well, there are some letters that are attributed to Plato. People mostly think now that they're um, not authentic, but uh, but there's no letter from Plato to Aristotle, 
right? There's, and we don't have their, like, their diaries, and we can't, you know, we don't have, like, uh, they didn't, like, there isn't like a list of which students were registered at Plato's Academy every year, right? I mean, there's there's just nothing. There's just like a few reports that, you, that everything rests on a few little pieces of information, right? Right. So anyway, um, and and so like you know, rather than trying to form a picture by gathering everything together, everyone's just like in, in studying ancient history it's just like going over these same few pieces of information over and over again trying to get something out of them yes um, so was an example of the set of subject and in a subject activity like something like love like it, it, it could be in socrates but you if you saw socrates you would say that that's love like kind of like this whole thing of science well, it's, you know, I think there's something that's still confusing you here. Maybe I just haven't said straightforwardly enough. So, like, so basically what's said of a subject means, like, what is said of a subject is a species or genus to which the subject belongs, right? That's what all these examples, that's what the relationship always is here, right? These are human, forest, animal, and these are going to be Right, like science or knowledge is a genus to which grammaticality belongs, and the individual grammaticality in, in Socrates belongs to this species, and therefore, and therefore belongs to this genus, and ultimately belongs to the genus quality. Right. So the thing that you could ask, what is it, and you could get the answer: it's science or knowledge. Is this accent not Socrates? Oh, so it's not because Socrates has knowledge, it's because Socrates is a part of knowledge? It's because Socrates has knowledge that, or, well, Socrates has knowledge because certain individual, individual accidents that belong to this genus are in Socrates. Right? Like, or similarly, like Socrates, so, like, here's another example of uh, individual accident. The whiteness in Socrates. So Socrates is white because there's an accident of whiteness in him. He's sometimes white, right? Like so when Aristotle talks about Socrates being white versus Socrates being black, he's not talking about racial categories, obviously. It's, it's apparently it's not clear to me at least whether it's He's talking about like becoming pale or tanned or whether it like like blushing or you know like but anyway it's 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 something in some way that he changes color so anyway so at some time socrates is white because there's an accident of whiteness in socrates an individual accident of whiteness in socrates and similarly socrates is colored also because there's an individual accident of whiteness in socrates Right, that is Socrates has some color, namely white. And that again is because, like, if you followed this tree to a different branch, you would get to sensible qualities. And then under that, you would get the color. And then under that, you would get to white. And then under that, you would get to all the individual accidents of whiteness, one of which is this, right? So um, so color is in Socrates because an individual accent of the whiteness is in Socrates. Okay. But color is not said of Socrates because Socrates isn't a color. Okay. Socrates, but 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 the accident in Socrates is a color. So color is said of this. It's right, color is said of this Dorito, which is the whiteness in Socrates. Right. Right, if you ask what is this, the answer is it's a color. Okay. So I guess maybe I okay, I, I maybe I understand what's confusing here. That like if this is color, it's said of a subject and it's in a subject, but it's not the same subject. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, I think maybe that's what's confusing yeah. you. Right, the, the subject that it's in is Socrates, for example, right. but the subject that it's set of is this accident of it's that what, accident. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you.
All right. I hope that cleared that up. Yes, more questions. Uh, I don't know who was first. But... Oh, you can go ahead. Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, but there are other accidents that are not um, qualities, right? Like every other category that's not a substance is an accident, right? Right. So an accident would also be um, Socrates has, uh, or it would just be like, oh, in in the classroom, that would be an accident. Or like at four o'clock. Or like, yeah, it's not just like the the quality of, of whiteness, right? Right. So that whole list. So I mean, and you can see why why someone might have their doubts about realism about those things, right? Yeah. Realism about every category means that yeah, if Socrates is in the room, there's an accident. There's a thing that's the accident of being in the room that's in Socrates. Mm -hmm. um, um, so you can see what like tended to push people towards nominalism about accidents. But um, um, but on the other hand, uh, like why do we have this distinction between substance and accident? Well, um, I mean, there's two basic problems. And they're both problems that, that Plato was trying to address using the forms. So Aristotle is giving a different version of it, right? So one problem is, like here you have Eusephilus and another horse. Uh, This other horse is Inquitatus. That was the horse that uh, that Caligula supposedly wanted to make make into a senator, right? Um, right. So, anyways, <laughs> these are two individual horses. This is a horse, and remember, there's no definite article, no indefinite article in Greek. So the way you say this is. Eusephilus is horse. Incitatus is horse. And yet Eusephilus is not Incitatus. Weird, right? <laughs> That's one problem. Another problem is here's Socrates white, and here's Socrates black later. So, um, well, I mean, let me draw it without the, the readings so you can see what the problem is. Well, so for Socrates to change from white to black, the white has to become black. But the white can't be black. That's a contradiction. <laughs> so change is impossible. <laughs> um, they, you know, so... Uh, um, so, like, this system is trying to solve both of those problems. This, this problem is solved by saying that although Bucephalus and Incitatus are the same in substance, because they're both horses, they, they differ in accidents. For example, and this is what this is what pushes you towards realism about these weird categories. For example, they weren't in the same place at the same time, <laughs> right? That's one. That's that's one thing that makes them different, even though they're both horses. And similarly, so and here you say, well, the, no, the substance continues. It's the accident that changes. So the substance, so the white doesn't become black. The substance that was white becomes black. 
And that resolves the contradiction. Um, and, you know, and both of these things are, are things that Aristotle is, is, you know, uses it for. And you can see, again, in this case, like, if you ask, like, is Socrates standing the same as Socrates sitting, which, <laughs> or, no, sorry, is Socrates the same as Socrates standing? That's a question that Aristotle, you know, gives an example of a philosophical question in uh, Metaphysics. Gamma, maybe? Right. So um, is Socrates the same as Socrates standing? Well, like, yes and no. Socrates, it's, 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 it's still Socrates. But on the other hand, if you said that Socrates is the same as Socrates standing, then Socrates could never sit. <laughs> so the way, so again, the way Socrates can sit is because the accent of the position standing is what changes. So it's so the standing is not the same as Socrates, even though Socrates standing is the same as Socrates. <laughs> and that again is why you, you want to have a distinction between two different things, Socrates and the standing. It's, there's like a ton of questions that keep, I, uh, which is which is good. <laughs> Um, I might not get to talk about all the things I wanted to do, but that's all right, you know, whatever. So, yes. Um, so, like, it's kind of an etymology question is why did substance, like, I kind of understand substance being what it is, but accident feels like kind of a strange term for what it's describing. Do you know where, like, people started, like, the translation to the word accident would kind of make sense? Well, actually, so you're thinking that accident is a weird term for this, but actually the, the question is why we use accident to mean what we do. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right. Um, uh, because, right, so so the Greek words, this is really interesting, although I don't know if it's something you want to know or not, but so the Greek words are... Uzia, as I said, which is a form of the verb to be, and sum debe kas. And this is an epsilon. Right. Um, right. So this, I mean, it's being used to mean being. <laughs> um, like the, the, the primary kind of being, or something like that. Um, the real question is, why was it translated into Latin as substantia rather than es essentia? And the answer is that sometimes it was translated as essentia, right, and in certain contexts, and that's where we get the word essence. <laughs> um, but in this type of context, it was translated as substantia. Why? So in ordinary Greek, usia meant uh, um, like someone's estate or property. Like that was like pre like non-philosophical Greek had a use for this word, but it had nothing to do with being or I mean, I guess it's it's because it's a form of the verb to be, but it, it means someone's property, someone's estate. Sometimes the word substance is still used that way in English. Like you talk about a man of substance, means someone who has property. Um, but um so. And that's what substantia meant in ordinary Latin. And so they translated zia as substantia. <laughs> um, and then substantia, which doesn't have anything to do with being, <laughs> had to like, um, right? It means like standing under. <laughs> um, had to uh, take on the functions of this Greek word. Um, it, but as but so that's actually the weird one. <laughs> um, which in this case the translation is um, like I said, the translation of uh, what was the other word I read up here that was like that? Oh people came and on translated as subject. Right again. So, so this is this again as a calc. It translates. It's a little bit weird in this case, but it, this the sum is basically being translated as the act, and 
this is basically translated the bebe cost. And so like this means something that befalls something. Right? It's like falls on it kind of. <laughs> um, so the reason it's being used here is that it it's like metaphorically like something that happens to Socrates. Mm -hmm. Why we use it to mean like what happens when cars hit each other is probably a complicated story, but I'm not I'm not sure I know the right story. So I won't <laughs> yeah. So um going back to like the the accident thing at the uh the top row there. Yeah. Uh if you said like so if knowledge is in Socrates, you could then say like Socrates is knowledgeable or something like that. You're both referring to actions there. Yeah. Which, what that's that's what's known as denomination. Uh, um, Socrates can be denominated knowledgeable by virtue of the accent of the knowledge that is in him. So in like so in saying Socrates is knowledgeable and there's knowledge in Socrates, is that is are those like what fills both of those cells in the top there or are those filling well so this would be like the grammaticality in Socrates. Okay. By the way, I should say again, this is this this is the way this was traditionally understood. It's controversial. I think um, like if you ask John Bowen, he probably would say, no, that's not what Aristotle means. <laughs> but um, the grammaticality in Socrates. And if you look at, you know, if you look at least at that text, it, it's, Aristotle doesn't actually mention an individual accident in that text. Um, but this is the way it's it's it was usually understood, right? So there's there's a particular. I mean, um, there's more. Socrates has more than one. Well, actually, Socrates says that he doesn't have any knowledge, right? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but he's being ironic, yeah. On our like palm tree that is over there, yeah. The dramatic quality that is on who's in below. The science of knowledge. Like so science this isn't science. Knowledge. This is science or knowledge. Right? Right. These right. are two different translations of epistemology. Um, yeah, the grammatical is below in the same way that like horse is below animal. Okay. Right. This is this is a species of knowledge. Um, yes. <laughs> Socrates individual grammaticality that's under grammaticality as a whole right that's what all the little yes yeah that's what these little dots are supposed to mean okay <laughs> right so one of these little dots is this Dorita would it be fair to say because of like the word accident grammaticality happens to Socrates I mean that's the metaphor but you know but and I mean that's the metaphor that's that's implicit in the in the word. It 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 fits some accidents better than others. Yeah. You know. Um uh I mean one of the categories is action. Right? It's a little bit weird to say that happens to Socrates. That's what Socrates does, right? Um but yeah, that's that's the metaphor. It's something that like fall, fell onto him, <laughs> <laughs> fell together with him. Um, okay, there's five minutes left. My question is, which of these things? I actually did talk about most of the things in my notes here. Um, I guess so. There's all right. So I th there is one really important thing that I didn't get to. Do. So so far I've been drawing Socrates like this, you know, stick figure with Doritos stuck in it. 
But remember that one of these Doritos is, is the quantity of Socrates. And one of them is the shape of Socrates, because shape is one of the things in the, in the category of quality. So actually, this picture is a little misleading because the fact that Socrates is this shape is an accident, apparently. And the fact that Socrates is however tall he is, is an accident. And so how do we draw this? <laughs> in other words, what is a substance like? Um, what's left when you take away all the things that are in accidental categories? It's and that's that's actually going to be uh, the um, in a sense the main thing that the people in the third reading are going to be arguing over. Um, um, So I mean, I'll talk more about it next time, but I just wanted to 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 show like how quickly we get to that problem. Um, among other things, <laughs> but but I mean, but but actually, the truth is that's that part's not original with Leibniz, <laughs> right? That is. That that substance. So, like one answer, as we'll see, is this is this is Avicenna's answer. One answer is that substances are you know differentiated by special properties, but they're not sensible. Um, and. Uh, well, I'll say more about that when we get to Avicenna. But right, so it so it turns out, according to Avicenna, that when you sense a substance, like when you feel the, the heat of the fire, you're feeling an accident that's in the fire. You're not feeling the substance of the fire directly. Um, and most people after Avicenna follow Avicenna. As we'll see, the people before Avicenna have a different approach, um, right? So like this this right, should underline the point I made about, about Arabic philosophy being part of the history of Western philosophy. It's like a huge change in the understanding of Aristotle happened thanks to Avicenna. And everyone after Avicenna followed him and in a sense, including Descartes. <laughs> Right. So, um, so you wouldn't be able to understand the history of Western philosophy if you just tried to go from Augustine to um, Thomas Aquinas and leave out what happened in between. Okay, um, I guess that's it for now, and I will see you. So there's no class on Monday, and I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>